How many times have we made choices, have we made decisions in our lives without stopping to seek God's direction? Anybody ever done that? I'm alone. Okay, two of us. <laughs> yeah, three of us. There we go. I think I saw her. Yeah, we've all done that, haven't we? We've all done that. What normally happens as a result of that? How do those decisions often turn out? They fail. They turn out negative. That's right. They often turn out negative. Now, sometimes they seem like good choices for a while, and then they fail. Sometimes the failing is almost immediate. Uh, and when we fail to stop and just seek what God's want, what God wants, and what God's direction is, it fails. It doesn't turn out well because we we fail to stop and really seek the one whom we should be seeking when we're making deci decisions. Now, when it fails, who do we usually blame? God. You ever notice that? We make a decision without seeking God. We move ahead with the decision we've made, and when it fails, the first question that we often ask is somewhere along the lines of, how could God allow that? Where is God? Why didn't God protect me? Why didn't God stop this from happening? We almost always point our finger back at God. I was thinking about that in light of a number of different things, and I'm not going to give a lot of specifics necessarily here, but I was thinking about that in, in the matter of relationships. How many relationships now move ahead without really ever seeking and following what God's leading and direction is in the relationships? Many of them. And then when they fail, we wonder where God was. Well, how could God not bless my marriage? How could God not bless my relationship? And there's no consideration of the fact that the whole relationship was built ignoring God. How could we expect God to bless that kind of relationship? Uh, we see that in, in our families. You know, we go about our families and we go about... Uh, raising children, and we go about uh, our, our lives and, and our families, and, and how often do we just ignore God in those things? And yet in some way expect God to bless our, our family, about our finances. You know, I mean, do we consider God in our spending and how we use our finances? Do we consider God in our career choices, our, our choice of friends, our choice of entertainment, and any number of things in our lives? How many times do we move ahead in these areas without really seeking God's direction? And then wonder why they fail. And wonder where God is uh, and His blessing is in the midst of those things. And then, of course, the question that always comes to mind when I think about that is why? Why, why do we do that? Why do we not seek God's direction in our relationships and our families and our finances and those things? Why do we leave God out of those decisions or, or maybe even just blatantly ignore God's direction in those things? And I think there's a variety of reasons for it. And uh, we will talk about some of those as we move along in, in, in our message this morning. For today's message, I want to think about King David. And in our message this morning, uh, we're going to look at, at King David. And, and King David had a desire that was very heavy on his heart. Something that he just wanted to do. Something that was just driving him. And, and, and it was a good desire. There was nothing wrong with David's desire. It was something that he should desire. It was something that he should do. And yet David moved ahead with this good desire without seeking God's direction. He moved ahead with doing a good thing, but he moved ahead without stopping to seek God without asking God's direction, without looking into the law of God and seeing what God said about how to go about these things. Before we can really look at the foolish decision David made, we need to stop and get a little bit of background. We need to consider a, a little bit at least uh, of what happened before. David's decision is going to focus around the ark of God. The ark of God, if you read back through the scripture, the ark of God represented the presence of God. To have the ark of God in your presence was to be in the presence of God. When they went to the tabernacle to worship God, the ark of God was, was to be there. 
And it represented God. It represented all that God was. And, and it represented when the people came to where that was. It represented them coming to God. And, and so David's desire is going to revolve around that. It's going to revolve around the ark of God. As I said, normally the ark was placed in the tabernacle of God. And, and the people came there to, to worship God. Well, clear back in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the ark of God was lost. Not lost in the sense that it was misplaced. Lost in the sense that the enemy of Israel took it. They, they, they won it, in, in a sense, in, in battle. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Philistines had come to do battle with the army of Israel. And the Philistines had defeated Israel in battle. And, and so the, the Israelites had this great idea. Let's get the Ark of God. And we'll bring the Ark of God to battle with us. I mean, if we got the Ark of God, we can't lose, right? It was kind of a rabbit's foot. It was kind of a good luck charm. We're going we're gonna to get the, the Ark of God. And they brought the Ark of God out. And all of Israel celebrated. We now have the Ark of God. And the Philistines began to shake. And they began to tremble because, oh no, they have the Ark of God. Well, to make a long story short, the Israelites brought the Ark of God to battle. The Philistines rallied against them. They defeated the Israelites. They took the Ark of God. And now the Philistines have the Ark of God. Now the Philistines what needed to had what, what to the Israelites represented God. Represented God's presence. This is kind of a side note, but this is one of my favorite parts of that whole story, that whole account. Because the Philistines take the Ark of God. And uh, the Philistines, you know... They collected gods. And, and that sounds kind of rude or whatever, but, it, but they did. And, and so they had a god, I believe his name was Dagon. And, and they had a temple where they went and they worshipped Dagon. And of course Dagon is a, a statue with a figure. And they took the Ark of God and they put it in their temple. You know, now they had another god in their back pocket. Well, so they put, put the Ark there. The next morning they came to the house of Dagon and guess what happened? Dagon, the figurine, is laying on his face before the Ark of God. Now, I find this humorous because they then picked up their God and put him back on the shelf or pillar or whatever he stood on. And I'm thinking, okay, if I've got to pick my God off the floor, maybe I should leave him there. And so they, they picked up Dagon and they put him back on the shelf. Well, guess what? The next morning they came in. Dagon is again on the floor. Except this time his head's cut off. And his arms are cut off. And there's a trunk of Dagon. So, you know, I'm talking about foolish decisions. Rather than saying, hey, maybe we shouldn't worship Dagon. Their thought process, maybe we need to get rid of the Ark of God. And so the uh, Philistines then decided that they were, well, they were also uh, plagued with tumors at that point. God plagued them with tumors. And, and so they decided, hey, we need to get rid of the Ark of God. And so, you know, after a roundabout route, the Ark of God was finally, by the Philistines, loaded onto a cart. Keep that in mind, because it's going to come back later in our account. They loaded the Ark of God on a cart, hooked it up to, I think it was two oxen, you know, figuratively speaking, slapped the oxen in the butt, you know, the way you would slap a horse or an oxen in the butt, setting down the road. We don't want the Ark of God anymore, and we don't want to touch it. We don't want to be near it. It's plagued us since we had it. We put it on a cart, sent the oxen down the road in the direction of Israel, and said, hey, you can have your Ark. We, we don't want it here anymore. Well, finally, it ended up in the house of Abinadab. And being in the house of Abinadab, the Lord blessed his house. And the Ark of God stayed in the house of Abinadab <coughs> For, I believe, 20 years. So now that's a little bit of background. The house of, or the Ark of Abinadab, or the Ark of God, has been in the house of Abinadab for 20 years. And now David is king. And in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David says, you know, the Ark really should be in Jerusalem. The Ark belongs here. This is our capital city. This is our holy city. We need the ark here. Now, David's desire was a great thing. I, I believe that is where the ark should have been. It should have been in Jerusalem. It should not have been in the house of Abinadab. And, and David, you know, David in 
his life, as we read in several places, always had a spot in his heart for the ark of God or the presence of God. You know, that, that's what later on makes David look at all of that and say, you know, I have a wonderful house that I live in. What is, what is the presence of God? I need to build a house for God. I mean, David always had a soft spot there. He always was concerned about God and God's presence and, and where the ark of God was. And again, that, that is a wonderful thing. It was, David was right in his desire. But then we move ahead here, and it brings us to the place where David is now set up, in, in a sense, to make a foolish decision. In order to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem, David put a lot of planning and a lot of preparation into it. And you read this in the first couple of verses of, of chapter 6. David gathered together, as we read earlier, 30,000 chosen men of Israel. Now, this is going to be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal. I've got 30,000 chosen, selected, hand-picked, however you want to say that, men. And, 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 and we're going to use these men to bring in the ark of God. Now, in, in our term today, they're going to have a parade. They're going to have a parade. And why do we have a parade today? In a lot of senses, it's to celebrate. Okay? This is kind of a side note, but in Little Meadows, they're building a new firehouse and a new ambulance garage. Well, guess what they're planning on doing in October? We're going to have a parade. I have nothing really to do with the parade, but they're, they're having a parade. Why? Something big is happening, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to, we're going to let everybody know that we're, we're just thrilled with the support and, and all of those things. That's exactly what David's doing. There are 30,000 men. And we're going to go, and we're going to get the ark of God, and we're going to bring it back, and we're going to sing, and we're going to play instruments, and we're going to dance, and we're going to celebrate. David also, in planning this, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, consulted with the political leaders and the people of Israel. So David, is, this isn't a whim. This isn't something David woke up one morning and said, hey, I think I'm going to go get the ark of God. David has been thinking about it. He has been planning. In 1 Chronicles 13, it says, David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and from the Lord our God, let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel, as well as to the priests and the Levites and the cities that have pasture lands that they may be gathered to us. Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. All the assembly agreed to do so for the right thing, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now, David, again, this isn't a whim. David is planning. He's asking. He went to all of the, the leaders of hundreds and thousands, and he said, hey, what do you think of this? It's a great thing. He went to the priests. Wonderful. Great idea. Let's do it. Called all the people. Hey, what do you think? We think this is wonderful. We think this is a good thing. And, and so David is involving people, and he's going and he's seeking advice, and he's seeking counsel. Seemingly, he's doing the right thing. And then we read that David built a new cart just for this occasion. David built a new cart to bring the ark. Where, where do you suppose he got that idea? How had they got back to Israel to the house of Abinadab? Got to be a good thing, right? They did it once. The Philistines did it. And, and, and it worked. It got there. So, so he's building a new cart, and he's planning all of that out. Well, the one thing that we didn't read, the one thing we didn't read, is that David never sought the Lord's direction. He never stopped and said, okay, Lord, how should I go about this? What should I do here? He never sought God's direction. Back in Exodus chapter 25, God gives very clear directions for moving the ark of God. It was to be carried using poles made of a kale wood overlaid with gold. It was to be carried by the sons of Kohath on their shoulders. And even they, according to Exodus chapter 25 and Numbers chapter 4, even they were not allowed to touch the ark. Hence the need for the poles. You see, they didn't touch the ark. They put poles through the rings that were on the four corners, and they lifted the poles, and
and they carried it. God gave very clear instructions. In Numbers chapter 4, God taught there that anyone who touched the ark of God would die. Now that seems harsh, doesn't it? It seems harsh to us. Why did God do that? What was God's purpose in that? God's purpose was like it was for all of the law. None of the law was designed, and we've talked about this already, none of the law was ever designed to make a person righteous. It was all designed to show that we were not righteous and that God was holy and set apart. That, that was the purpose of all of it. The purpose of not touching the ark and the purpose of carrying it was to demonstrate that God was completely set apart. That he was holy and only by his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness can we ever come to God. And, and so God gave very clear directions here of what the people needed to do if they were going to move the ark of God. I was thinking about that this week, actually the last couple of weeks. How could David have missed such a clear set of instructions? How could he miss that? How could David miss something that was so blatantly obvious and taught in Scripture? How could he have not followed that? How could he have not known that? If you notice in 2 Samuel chapter 5, David was in a position to make another decision, and this was an important decision as well. And it says in verse 19, And David inquired of the Lord... Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And, and the Lord said to David, Go up, and I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And then uh, we read in verse 23, and, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come against them uh, opposite the balsam trees. You know, David has a history of saying, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Should I go to battle? Should I not go to battle? Should I attack? Should I not attack? How do I win the battle? How do I not? What do I do? How do I go about? David has a reputation of that. David continually asks God's direction. So then, how could he have missed it here? How could he have not when it came to the ark? The only thing I have is an opinion. I believe that David knew that what he was doing was the right thing to do bringing the ark to Jerusalem, that is. And, and I believe that David said, you know, it's not wrong, the ark needs to be here. And because I'm doing something that I know is right, I don't think he ever stopped to consider, I need to ask God about how to do this. What I'm doing is right, so why should I need to, to stop? And I don't know that he thought through that whole process. I think that what happened is, yeah, I need to bring the ark here. Obviously, it's the right thing to do. And he never even considered it anymore. Because he knew that it was right. He knew it was the right thing to do. I was reading Warren Mearsby's book uh, this week, one of his commentaries. And Warren Mearsby said, It's possible to have zeal without knowledge and to do a good work the wrong way. In other words, it's possible to do a good thing the wrong way. And to go about it the wrong way. And I think, you know, everything that we do as Christians needs to be done as we seek God's guidance and direction. And, and that's true of the things that we're not sure God wants us to do. And it's true of the things that we know God wants us to do. Why did God seek direction in chapter 5? Well, what's the right thing, to go to battle or not to go to battle? I have no idea. So I'd better ask God. In the next chapter, what he's doing is a godly thing. So why do I need to ask God? I don't need to pursue that. I know what God wants. And, and yet he needed to stop. And I think that the same thing is true in, in our lives. Even when we're doing what, exactly what we know that God wants us to do, we need to stop and ask God's direction. A couple of examples. Soul winning. Does God want us to share our faith with those around us? Absolutely. Should we ever do that without praying and ask God's direction first? No. We need to pray and say, God, help me to share Christ. I was sharing that with somebody recently. They were struggling with uh, a friend of theirs and the desire to, to share Christ with them. And one of the, the comments that I, I gave them is, hey, 
make sure that you're praying for your friend and praying for God to give opportunities. And you know what? I never considered that. I mean, I know God wants me to share Christ, so I never thought about praying and asking God to direct my opportunities into open doors. How about ministry? Does God want us to minister and to serve Him? Absolutely He does. Absolutely He does. Should we ever do that without saying, God, direct my steps? Give me the words. Give me the opportunity. Help me with the opportunities that you give. How about marriage and relationships? Does God want people to be married? Absolutely He does. He created marriage. It was His idea. Should we ever move ahead with that without seeking God's leading and direction and guidance? Absolutely not. It's a good thing. Absolutely. But we need to seek God in the midst of those things. And I think, you know, if we are moving ahead in any area of our lives and not seeking God's guidance, we need to stop. And we need to stop and, and say, Lord, I need you to guide me. I need you to direct me. I need to know what you want in the midst of this. As we move ahead here, ultimately as a result of, of David's foolish decision, in verses 5, 6, and 7, we see a man named Yusa that loses his life. And, and it would be easy, I was thinking about this, it would be easy to blame David for that. It was David that chose to put the ark on a card. It was David that chose to move the ark. But it wasn't David that chose to stick out his hand and touch the ark. It wasn't David that chose to stick out his hand. And I thought, you know, Yuza, again, Yuza was doing what he thought was a good thing. The ark is shaking and I need to stabilize it. But in Numbers chapter 4, God said, if you touch the ark, you will die. And so again, Yuza made a foolish decision. It was a good thing. It was... His motive was right. He was focused on doing the right thing, but he went about it the wrong way. He went about it without following God's direction. And any time we move ahead without knowing God's heart and knowing God's will, there will be consequences. I have an illustration, and, and I, I, maybe I'll step on toes, and maybe I won't. And I, I'm certainly not sharing it to step on anybody's toes, but... It's something that I've been dealing with all week, not in my own life, unless you look at Annette and blame her. If she'll look at me and blame me. It has nothing to do with us. <laughs> but I, I have been uh, dealing with a situation all week that revolves around just this. And so I thought as vaguely as I can, with still getting some of the details, I, I would share that. But I thought, you know, think about it in light of marriage and, and relationships. Put, put it in that context. And I thought, you know, far too many people today, in their relationships, ignore God's instruction. They ignore God's direction. And they go about building their relationship in the wrong way. And they, 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 they go about, you know, doing things that, that, that God even says is wrong. And then... You know, on that foundation, things fall apart. They don't work. And, and again, as I said earlier, then people go back and they say, where is God and how could God and, and what did God allow and where, why didn't God bless my marriage and my relationship? And, and they begin to point the finger at God. And, and you know what? David did the same thing. After all of this happened in verse 8, David was angry because the Lord broke out against Yuza. That wasn't God's fault. That was David's fault, and it was Yuza's fault. If they had gone about it the right way, none of that would have happened. But they ignored God. And I thought, you know, fortunately today, God doesn't often strike people dead when they do those things. And I, I'm not trying to scare anybody because God, God often doesn't strike us dead. But there are consequences. There are consequences. Anytime we ignore God's word, ignore God's directions and move ahead, even if we're moving ahead with a good thing, God will not bless that. 
unless we go about it God's way. Foolish decisions are made when we fail to stop and ask God. And stop to consider what God wants and what God says about those decisions in our lives. Foolish decisions are made when we fail to stop and ask God. But I thought I want to end on that note. Because there is good news in the midst of that. There isn't any of us sitting here that haven't made foolish decisions. There isn't any of us sitting here that hasn't moved ahead and not asked God. And there isn't any of us here that have, have not suffered the consequences of this. The good news is, however, that no matter where we are, God is willing in His mercy and His grace to give or to take the opportunity to stop, to seek Him, to repent of what we have done and to follow His need. And that you know, David, David is given that exact opportunity. David makes a mistake. It's foolish. It's ridiculous. It's silly. He shouldn't have done it. He suffered as a result of that. But, if you read the rest of the chapter, when David repented of what he had done, and David turned away from what he had done, God gave him the opportunity to go and get the ark and to bring it back to Jerusalem. And God blessed the city as a result of that. But as you read the verses to follow, when David did it the second time, he said he had on the linen ephod. Well, that meant David sought God's direction. When he went about it the second time, notice that it says they carried it in on a pole. They did it the right way. And God, in his mercy and his grace, is willing to forgive us and to give us the opportunity to begin to build again following his principles and his commands. And when we do that, God bless us. Let's take a moment and bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy. It's so easy to sit here this morning and to point our fingers at David and say, what a foolish decision. How could he have done that? And yet there's not one of us here that hasn't done exactly the same thing. Maybe not with the ark. Maybe not uh, the way David did, but we have pursued a good thing the wrong way. And Lord, we've wondered where you were and where your blessing was and why things ended the way they did or why we're struggling the way we are. Lord, help us to see when we've done what David did. Help us to stop as David did. Help us to repent as David did. Help us to experience your mercy and your grace as David did. And Lord, help us to be able, as David did, to begin anew. And as we begin anew and go about things your way, I pray that we would see your blessing, that we would see your hand, and Lord, that we would be able to see you work in a way that only you can in our lives and in the decisions that we make. Lord, we thank you in Christ's name.